Hey, good day. My name is John Fulton. I'm with Ohio State University and Ohio State University Extension. Really excited to have you here today on our Ag Tech Tuesday that we've been holding. Uh, if you haven't joined us in, in the month of January, we had uh, four topics that really related to our Precision U, and that was just tackling some of the uh, shortened windows that we have in the spring for planning and getting spraying done. And so we had some really good speakers and, and topics. And so, uh, but for the month of February, excited to have you here. And, and we're gonna really be focusing on some of uh, the on-farm research that's ongoing here at Ohio State University and specific to our eFields program. And so I really welcome you here for today. Uh, our topic today is improving profitability in corn production. And uh, as we know, um, we want to be uh, efficient. We want to be on time. And with that, uh, really excited to have uh, a suite of speakers today that uh, work through some of the on-farm research that we got going on and sharing what they've learned and considerations here as we go into 2021. And so we hope you like the program. And, uh, and um, again, appreciate you being here. Before we start, uh, a few little housekeeping items. Uh, this session will be recorded. Uh, you will receive an email with the recording link, uh, which will also be posted to, to our YouTube channel. And speaking of that, if you want to go back and haven't joined us up until this point for Ag Tech Tuesdays, please uh, please check out our uh, Ohio State Precision Ag YouTube channel and, and all of our prior uh, presentations here for this year have been posted there. So take an opportunity to, to view them. And if you're looking for some CCA credits, they're, uh, they're also um, available through watching those. Uh, in terms of questions, we ask uh, at any point you got a question or comment, please put that in uh, the Q&A chat feature. You can find that at the bottom of the screen, okay? But uh, just at any point, uh, type that in and uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll get that inserted. Uh, we will use this chat feature and, and uh, poll questions to get feedback and, and address questions, basically when we get to the end uh, after our speakers uh, during Q&A. Kind of start off with, uh, as you sit and uh, get comfortable for today's uh, conversation around uh, profitable corn production, uh, what questions on your farm could you answer with on-farm research? And uh, just type in your response there for all panelists and attendees. We'll take a few seconds to, to wait for people to respond. Uh, but with that theme, that's really what our eFields program is focused on is conducting uh, on-farm research and bringing those learnings not only to, to you if you're collaborating with us, but to others, not only in uh, your region, but statewide. But uh, kind of last call here, what questions on your farm could you answer with on-farm research? We appreciate everyone uh, uh, putting their responses in. And so we're gonna move on here. Our Ag Tech tip of the week, uh, this is a great time of the year just before planning to make sure uh, whether it's for the display um, or you can do this in some of your platforms um, out there, the software packages set all this up and then ultimately transfer this out to the in-cab display. But it's a great time to set up your farms and fields. If nothing else, double check those. And then even within that, if you wanna go ahead and put your hybrids and varieties in there, uh, for your corn and soybeans as well. If you're going to be conducting on-farm research, uh, kind of a part of that is we go ahead and, and with most of our collaborators use our variety tracking. Uh, you see an example of that on the, on the right to identify treatments. And so uh, you can see here, and uh, this is thanks to one of our, our collaborators, uh, Ken Worley's in, in Miami County, uh, but you can see they got for most of the field what they're planning as far as our um, uh, corn hybrids concern, but you can see we're doing a seeding rate trial here uh, and we go ahead and we just go to and, and already have those all set up before we get to the field. And as you line up and you plant those treatments, uh, you just click on that particular hybrid and, and you're going and it labels that. And so uh, you can even see that we had a prescription or, or prescription based variable rate seeding uh, piece of this as well. But anyways, great time to kind of go through that, check your farms, fields, and hybrids and varieties. Uh, and be doing that now before you get to the field. Makes it a lot simpler just to click on the field. 
uh, and ultimately in what farm it's related to. And you can go down through your list and click on your hybrid or varieties that, that you're planting for that field. So with that, let's go ahead uh, and move into our program. Just a refresher here that uh, our eFields report is out. Uh, we're going to be talking here today about results from the 2020 growing season. And so you can find inserts uh, and studies for our presenters here um, in within this report. Uh, you can see the online version uh, at the go.osu.edu.efields. If you have a hard copy version, you can follow along here today. Uh, but if you want a hard copy version, please reach out and we'll get to that at the end here. But uh, reach out to us and uh, send us an email and we'd be happy to send you a hard copy. So with that, again, welcome to our Ag Tech Tuesday and, and kind of our eFields version of this. We've got four topics for the day that, that are really focused on improving profitability in corn production. First, we're talking about weather and climate trends, moving to some irrigation ideas, uh, corn seeding rates results. We get a lot of questions on that. And then finally doing some possible variable rate seeding based on smart firmer data. So with that, I want to welcome Aaron Wilson, and um, Aaron is uh, pretty well known, I think, uh, but his background uh, kind of in the weather slash climate. Uh, he works both for extension and uh, and and in bird polar as a state specialist as well. But uh, welcome, Aaron, and I really look forward to hearing uh, what you have to share for here for our audience today. Well, thank you, John, and it's certainly a pleasure to be here today. Uh, talking about the 2020 growing season, uh, my contribution to Eve Fields here for Ag Tech Tuesday. Uh, certainly, uh, 2020 had some memorable moments and memorable periods. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that today to help you kind of put a close to 2020 and also thinking about uh, getting started here in 2021. I can't believe it's February already. Uh, you know, we've, we've been pretty dry uh, fairly warm as well this winter. Uh, things are starting to get a little more active um, over the last uh, week or two, and we think that's going to continue as well, but I'll save that for the end of the presentation today, and we'll focus first on last year. So if I were to ask you to describe the weather of 2020, I think I'd get a lot of different answers. I think some would talk about the perhaps it was perfect season or average season. I think some of you would remark that it, it was hot uh, or cold, maybe during different parts of the year, that certainly was the case, uh, and dry and wet, certainly depending on where you are or where you were and are located in Ohio. And I would argue we, we've seen you know, all of the above here for 2020. And so I wanna break that down a little bit and kind of reflect on, on some of those conditions uh, that we saw last year. So if we look at our, our temperatures for 2020, it was actually the seventh warmest year on record for Ohio uh, going back 126 years, back to 1895. So very warm conditions. And what I'm showing you here are the differences compared to average, which we uh, reflect as 1981 to 2010 currently. Um, and we're looking at our average highs on the left. So that's the, the average of the daily high and low. And then showing you the differences compared to the long-term mean of daily highs in the middle and overnight lows on the right-hand side. So warm pretty much across the state. I would say definitely in the averages and in the overnight lows. We know that our overnight lows uh, really have seen more warming than our daytime highs. And it, it really, uh, that really was the case for 2020 as well, as they were slightly closer to average for the southern half of the state uh, during the year of 2020. But again, seventh warmest year on record in the last 126 years. There were certainly seasonal differences that, that do play into uh, the conditions that we saw last year. You know, we had a very warm March, 11th warmest on record, and then a cold April and May. Climatologically, that, that kind of washes out to, to um, an average spring, but we know those details really matter. And then as we got into the summer, we dried out quite a bit. and We had a very warm summer, uh, a very warm July in particular, and those warm conditions continued throughout our, our fall and harvest season as well. Um, so with that cold in April and May, we had frequent freezes, uh, periods below freezing here well into May. This is a figure uh, from the Mid Midwestern Regional Climate Center showing uh, the late season freeze events across our region. So much of Southwest Ohio, that, that date fell between May 1st and May 10th. For much of us across Ohio, it was actually after the 11th, uh, 13th, I think uh, 15th in some locations, seeing our last freeze of the season. Uh, so a little bit different than we've seen over the last couple of years with these late freezes 
uh, well into May this year. Now looking at precipitation for the year, it was our 29th wettest year on record for Ohio. Uh, some of you, especially up there in the Northwest are thinking, how could it be in the top 30 wettest? Uh, certainly if we look at the amount of rainfall on the left-hand side, much of Ohio picked up between 40 and 50 inches of precipitation for the year. Uh, the winter was close to Cleveland with, with about 58 inches of precipitation. Uh, but you just had to go over to the northwest corner where many folks over there saw about 25 to 30 inches of precipitation for the year. So running deficits on the order of three to even nine uh, inches of uh, precipitation below average last year. So very dry up there but fairly wet for, for the remainder of the state. And it was really a tale of two different seasons here. We went from a wet spring, again, this wet, cold spring, uh, especially in March, 15th wettest March, 17th wettest spring, to a very dry summer, 29th driest on record. Again, 126 year record here, especially in June and July. And then we had some uh, you know, more moisture around uh, during the month of August potentially helping out some of those yields, but also potentially leading to some of the disease issues, the toxin issues uh, that we saw across the state as well. Of course, we had some drought with those dry, warm conditions. Uh, this was the height of the drought here. We're talking 37% of the state covered by moderate drought conditions, uh, the beige color there on the right-hand side. Uh, across their north, uh, northern, northwestern, north central counties, down the Bell Fountain Ridge, and then parts of south central Ohio as well, Pickaway County in particular. Uh, and this, this photo from Hardin County, from Mark Bodicher here in, in, in Hardin County, just kind of tells the tale there in July of those very dry and hot conditions there across this portion of the state. So if we look at our top 10 wettest and our top 10 warmest years, They've all occurred, or eight of them, sorry, eight of the top 10 wettest and warmest have all occurred since 1990. So there's no doubt that we're farming in a warming and a warmer and a wetter environment these days. Uh, even with the drought or even with the wet conditions, we're still seeing these mid-growing season drought. Uh, they can be short-lived and intense. Uh, but also with the extreme rainfall that we're seeing, the ex extreme precipitation downpours as well, all of this tied to our overall changing weather patterns. Now with the warmer conditions, there could be some opportunities, especially when we think about growing season length. We know for instance, it's, and this is an example from Fulton County, that we've extended our growing season by about 10 to even 20 days, depending on where you are in the state. Uh, so a, a, a lot of that, more of that is coming into uh, an extended fall season where we don't see that first freeze uh, as soon as or as early as we did back in the 70s and the 80s, for instance. And even our last spring freeze uh, is getting earlier in the season as well. Now, 2020 bucked those trends just a little bit, but again, they're well within uh, the, the trend that we've seen overall uh, since 1970. Now with our rainfall, seeing more rainfall, more intense rainfall, especially winter into spring, uh, we've seen a decline, continued decline in our suitable field work days during the month of April and October, highlighted here by the blue and the orange curves, and that's since the mid 1990s. So a lot of us perhaps are thinking about other windows or how can we get into our, our fields in the springtime with the wet conditions. Certainly, if you look at May, it's been fairly flat. So, so you know, plenty of opportunities here, perhaps uh, depending on how wet it is in May, obviously. But even if we're thinking getting in later, you know, if, if, if that's your plan or your decision making, uh, our suitable field work days are increasing during the month of June with extended falls. This might afford us a, a little bit of a window. Certainly, it's not every year that we see late freezes, even though that's the trend. So all of this obviously has to go into those hard decisions that you have to make. I just have to talk about the weather. So I have I have it easy there. All right. So to wrap up today, I do want to give you a little outlook. It does look like our pattern has picked up quite a bit. So we're looking at above average temperatures, I think, as we head through the month of February with a good chance of seeing above average precipitation as well. And I expect that to continue throughout our planning season. I think it uh, we're going to moisten up first. We've got plenty of capacity to pull in some moisture right now with dry soils, especially across northwestern Ohio. But eventually they're going to be pretty saturated. Saturated, I think, as we get to March and April. And this is likely to continue uh, into the month of May. So just a kind of an early heads up on our planning season here. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. You can always reach out to me at wilson.1010 at osu.edu. Love talking about weather and climate anytime. So with that, thank you again, and I'll turn it back over to John. 
Well, Aaron, thanks for, for sharing with us today. Great insight. And as we move into spring, we know it's uh, so just looking back, as you talked about, can be challenging uh, to, to, to deal with some of our weather conditions. But at the end of the day, we got to be ready. Uh, we got to have our, our planters and, and sprayers and uh, kind of ready for spring work. So I uh, appreciate you sharing. Next up, we have uh, Amanda Doritas and Will Hammond. Uh, we welcome them both here today, and they're going to talk about making irrigation decisions. So I'm going to turn it over to you and Amanda. Um, Will, thanks. Hi, I'm Will Hammond. I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resource Extension Educator with OSU Extension in Pike County. And I'm Amanda Doritas. I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Educator in Champaign County. Today, we want to talk about some of our e-fields research. Uh, we have on-farm research program working with soil moisture probes uh, with di different growers in each of our counties. So we, we kind of got interested in this a little bit because we have several growers who have irrigation pivots or interest in it and we're trying to figure out how to better manage, you know, these resources that farmers have put into their fields. Uh, I know some of the guys I've worked with, they, they spend a lot of money and investment and time putting up the, the pivot and maybe a little bit less time on not understanding when and how to operate it. Yeah, and the same thing here in Champaign County, this was my second year doing this type of work. And you know, we have some information from farms out west who've been using irrigation for a little bit longer, a little bit more in detail, but I really wanna bring that information here and help our producers and prepare if there's you know future interest as we see some changing climate and drier summers and things like that in Ohio. Absolutely. And that's a lot of guys, you know, would, would say that's the biggest challenge they got through is, you know, dry summers. So we had a dry spell and we didn't get enough rain. And now with the pivots, we can, we can address that. And like you touched on, we get a lot of information from out West, maybe Nebraska or somewhere where irrigation is a lot more heavily utilized. Um, but now that doesn't necessarily pertain to, to Ohio or to our individual growers. So, that's why guys were really excited to use some of our research uh, to kind of make better decisions. Um, you know, before it was kind of the old analogy, well, it's dust, dusty today or it's dry or it's not gonna rain, I better turn the pivot on. Or hey, the neighbor's running it, maybe we should go turn ours on too. So we're trying to address some of those concerns and figure out how we can you know, better help our growers uh, understand their irrigation systems. Yeah, really improve efficiency, fine tune and increase profitability if we're able to. Yeah, absolutely. Like at the end of the day, you got to be able to make money to, to keep on going. So we used a crop metric system, and this is a technology where I have a moisture probe in the ground. Uh, the probe goes into the soil uh, about 36 inches and has readings every four inches on that probe. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a picture of a cornfield uh, with the moisture probe and sensor there. Uh, the probe is down in the ground, so you can't actually see that but there's a pole where we have a solar panel and then the reading device and a rain bucket. And that allows the information to be collected in the field and then sent to their mobile app, which is there on the left-hand side of your screen. So this is just an example of the app uh, through CropMetrics where you're in there and it's giving you a breakdown of where that moisture level is in the soil, um, whether you need to be into that refill or uh, saturated stage. And those are kind of parameters that are set previously uh, in the growing season so you understand you know, where that level is and where it needs to be uh, for optimal crop growth. So moving into some of our research, this is from Pike County. I've got two examples here. These are graphs that are generated through their app and each of these spikes is gonna show an increase in moisture. Um, and these pictures here, it could be a rain event or an irrigation event. And I'll touch on that in just a second. Uh, but if you see in the background of each of these graphs, there's going to be a blue segment at the top, a green segment in the middle, and a red segment at the bottom. The red segment is going to signify that there needs to be uh, moisture added to the soil profile. The green is going to signify that you're in that kind of optimum range. And then the blue is going to signify that you are above optimum water content. So you're actually uh, not necessarily saturated soil, but there's an excess of water in the soil profile where that moisture probe is located. So looking at field one this, in this trial, that's going to be the top graph, there are several more peaks than you'll notice on field two. 
these two fields are actually just about a half a mile apart. Um, so just touching on the variability, uh, the, the field one here is much more sandy and a lower laying field than the one on field two. And so the moisture holding capacity just wasn't as high. So this producer was actually needing to irrigate more frequently to keep that moisture level in the optimal range for the growing season. Uh, so it was really important you know, that we were able to identify this and, and understand that we needed to add moisture to this profile, especially during different crop stages when that corn really needed it. So I have listed here that the average uh, bushel for field one was 241 for the irrigated segment of the field and was 214 for the non-irrigated segment of the field. Um, this is this field's about 650 acres with about 450 under the pivot. So a 241 bushel is, is pretty exciting for a, a 500 or 450 acre average and 214. Uh, this is also a, a yield contestant uh, entry. So we actually did have some better yields in the field. Uh, we're trying to figure out different varieties and hybrid selections. So I think that yield could have been moved a little bit uh, up if we did maybe, play, maybe plant more of one variety. Um, but you can see that by utilizing the, the moisture probe, we knew that we need to get water at crucial times to make sure that plant could grow optimally. Looking at field two, uh, we had a 243 average, so just a little bit better in our irrigated segment, and a 238 in our non-irrigated segment. Uh, but you can see that this field had a better moisture holding capacity where it was able to maintain more uh, water in that soil profile. Uh, so that plant didn't necessarily call for more moisture. Uh, but what I want to touch on is that, you know, a lot of people are going to see, well, this is only a five bushel difference. Well, this in this field, uh, the irrigation covers kind of the, the more uh, well-drained and, and poor moisture holding capacity area. And so it actually increased their historic yield by about 60 bushel. So on a normal year, uh, without irrigation, they would have only gotten about 170 to 180 uh, with no irrigation. Uh, with, with the irrigation, they're able to bump that up about 60 bushels. Uh, that's pretty impressive just by adding water to the rotation. Uh, the 238 that's not irrigated, um, that's actually the best soil, the, the darkest, heavier loams. It's going to have better moisture oil capacity, and just typically out yield um, the other segments of the field, even without the irrigation. So the grower is really happy to see that, uh, you know, based on plants needs, we're able to get water there when we needed it uh, by using the moisture probe, but then, you know, get that maximum yield possible out of these maybe poor areas of the field. What did you see in your research, Amanda? In Champaign County, I mentioned this was my second year. The first year, um, and you can look back at a fields 2019 for that, just had one grower, a couple different fields. But this year, I really wanted to look at how it affects decision making. So, for example, I had the sensors installed in five fields across three different farm managers around Champaign County. So the producers managing two fields had access to the real-time soil moisture data that you showed in the app to determine when to run their pivots. And then the managers of the other three fields didn't have access to that, right? So my goal was to see how utilizing the online real-time data affected those management practices. It's a difficult study to set up and gain statistical data from because if we tried to do a side-by-side -side comparison, I feel like the farmer who has access to the data, it would be hard for them to not let that knowledge really influence their decision-making if we tried to compare the same farmer using the data versus not using the data. So that's why I went with three different farmers but of course you have a lot of variables that come into play. Um, a couple of mine are seed producers, so we were able to collect yield. Um, but let me pull up a slide here so you guys can see um, what we found between those that had access and those that didn't. Okay, so here you can see the soil moisture probe readings and the producers managing fields one and two are the ones that had access to the data. So I highlighted those with the green boxes and then fields three through five highlighted in red weren't able to see it until the end of the growing season. Um, Will covered the different colors and what they mean. So I don't need to go over that again, but just remember the goal is to stay in that green area. So the producers with the access to the real-time data 
I think it looks like they were really able to stay in that green area. They didn't drop into the red. Um, they weren't up in that blue very often. And those in um, the manager of field three, you can see he was remained pretty wet throughout the growing season. So maybe a little bit on the higher end. And then managers for fields um, four and five, we see especially field five that dropping into red a lot more and that field does have lower water holding capacity. Um, but I think you can start to see here pretty clearly that the tool did help them make decisions. And feedback from the farmers who fully utilized the system, you know, they felt that it really helped them be proactive rather than reactive. And this was really helpful in 2020 in our area because we got really dry really early on. And some farms under irrigation had a hard time keeping up because they went based off of what they were used to when they typically start irrigating and just weren't able to put enough on where they were able to get started earlier and actually um, started before the seed was even out of the ground um, because we were so dry. Another farmer um, that wasn't able to access the data until the end of the season, you know, he's interested in doing some in-field comparisons to really fine tune how much water is needed. So that might be something we can do next year um, a couple of different treatments of the amount of water that goes on, see what the yields turn out to be, and um, go from there and see what's economical in that case. So in summary, while not a perfect study, I think the results do show that data from the sensors does help the producer more accurately apply water. I would agree, Amanda, and that was from all the cooperators with my segment of studies that they, they liked having the ability to make that informed decision. Um, you know, what's going on below the surfaces is extremely hard to see if you're staying on top of it. So that the probe really kind of gave them a look inside of what was going on underground with the moisture holding capacity or just water in that, that root zone availability. So uh, all the growers, I think that helped me last year with on-farm study are interested in doing it again. Uh, maybe even adding more probes, you know, we're covering large areas. Um, and field variability might be the next thing they want to address, uh, like in a comparison of maybe I need more or less water here or there. Right, depending on soil types. Yes. Yeah. So. All right, well, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda and Will. Uh, good information shared. And again, I think as we look forward and we think about not only about irrigation, but uh, really new ideas around managing water and nutrients, think about sensors and what they can mean and information they can provide uh, you as a grower or consultants to, to improve some decision making uh, but we appreciate the insights they gave on the on the topic of irrigation next up is uh, Chris Zoller he's an, a, a county extension educator and uh, always look forward to hearing from Chris and and he's going to be sharing some of the results they got from uh, corn seeding rates studies they did in his county so Chris I'll turn it over to you Hi, this is Chris Zoller. I'm the Extension Educator for Agriculture and Natural Resources in Tuscarawas County. And I want to take just a few moments to share with you the results of one of our eFields on-farm research projects that we conducted in 2020. The one I'm going to share with you is our corn seeding rate population trial. We planted this plot on the 7th of May and it was harvested on October the 1st. It was a channel 210-95STX. We had a total of five treatments in this field that were replicated four times. And I wanna say a special thank you to Spillman Farms. They were the cooperator for this project and Spillman Farms has been with the fields program ever since it started. Great farm family, great management team. And I really appreciate the time they take every year to, to help the fields program, to help grow the program and really contribute their knowledge and expertise to making things successful. So we start off looking at some weather data from 2020. The red line that you see represents the maximum daily temperatures for that time period. The blue line represents the minimum daily temperatures for the time period. And below that you see some bars and those bars represent the daily precipitation for that time period. You'll also notice a, a vertical line on the left there, the heading is planting date. 
and a little bit further to the right is a line that represents the harvest date. So you kind of see that window from planting up through harvest. And then below that is a table that represents the kind of summarizes that growing season weather data. Uh, for the period of April through September. The final column is the total for, for that. So the first one is precipitation. And right below that, you see cumulative GDDs or growing degree days. And so the thing to note here is that under the July precipitation, we had less than an inch and a half of rain for July at this location. Uh, this location, this field is in the northern part of the county, right along the Tuscarawas River. It's a very sandy soil. And so that lack of moisture really hurt being in that sand, really hampered that final yield. Uh, had a lot of ears that just didn't develop properly, weren't filled out, stunted and that, that sort of thing. So we really needed that precipitation in July that we didn't get. This table summarizes the results of this corn population plot. The first column is the treatments that were applied. So we had a low of 24,000 and then we went up in 3,000 increments to up to 36. So it was 24, 27, 30, 33,000, and 36,000. The next column is average emergence, plants per acre, no problem there, very good emergence across the entire field. The third column represents moisture, and that ranged from uh, about 24.4 up to just over 25, so not a big variation in moisture. And the next column you'll notice is yield. Again, just like moisture, not a lot of variation. There wasn't much variation in yield. The low was 119, the high was 122 across each of those five treatments. You'll also note that each of those yield numbers has a, a letter A following that. That tells us that because each of those letters are the same, there was no statistical difference with those treatments. So then the final column is return above seed cost in dollars per acre. So we're asking the question, of the treatments that were applied, which one would result in the highest or the greatest return in dollars per acre above seed cost? For this plot, our 24,000 seeds per acre was the highest at $373 per acre. So again, just to summarize, the seeding rates at the low end was 24,000, the high end was 36,000, and we bumped those up in 3,000 increments. Didn't have any real problems across the field with any diseases that developed. There were no insects present, no weed problems. Had really good emergence across the entire field. You saw on that previous slide, the weather data showed that we didn't get much rain in July, very critical time for the corn plants to, to put on that grain. And because of that, because of the sandy soil, it did hamper final yield. This is not characteristic for this farm. Uh, generally, if we've got the moisture, this farm can can get some really good yields with those corn soybean crops. And then our financial analysis of our return above seed costs, again, it was highest at the 24,000 seeds per acre. This final slide represents the locations across Ohio in 2020 that had corn population plots. The gray circle represents Fulton County in Northwest Ohio. The green and yellow circles represent Miami County. There were two farms in Miami County that had corn population plots and then the red circles represent the Tuscarawas County plot. And so as we look at this, we see at the bottom the target seeding rate in 1,000 seeds per acre. So went from a low of 24,000 up to a high of almost 45,000 seeds per acre. And so as we look at that, we see that there's this 0.95 and most of those circles are at or above that line, which tells us that in each of those locations across the state, where these population plots were conducted, we were within 95% of relative yield, regardless of the seeding rate. There was the one in Miami County, the yellow was uh, between 85 and 90%, and one of the, the green dot represents Miami County that was between 90 and 95%. So overall, between those seeding rates, we were within 95% of relative yield. So the takeaway here is that if you're looking at ways to potentially minimize input costs, and if you're seeding at a higher rate, maybe backing that down will reduce that input cost and not sacrifice yield. So it is something to consider on your own farm and your own situation. Here's my contact information, my email address, my cell phone number if anyone has questions, would like to discuss 
Fields program or this project or others that I've conducted, I'd be happy to talk to folks about that. And then the digitalag.osu.edu slash eFields, you can access information about eFields and you can access the 2020 report as well as all prior year reports. So I thank you for your time. And again, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer those at any point in time. Thank you. Really good information, Chris. Thanks for uh, for sharing all that. And, and uh, you know, I just want to put a plug in as we think about seeding rates and what's the economic optimum for my farm that we think about that or encourage you to think about field by field. And then for some of you that may have already started or may be thinking about doing verberate seeding and corn, I really think one of the primary steps is that is know what your economic optimum is, what works best for that field before you fully jump into doing verberate seeding. But uh, we know uh, based on some recent results that there's some conditions that where verberate seeding can really make sense, but it really, really takes some on-farm research to, to kind of explore what what those seeding rates by zone should be for for your operation so again thanks chris for for sharing uh, next up, up is uh it's a pleasure to introduce dr elizabeth hawkins of course i want to note that uh, elizabeth's really the driver behind behind our e-fields program here and some of the work that she's been doing down in um uh around washington courthouse and thinking about where how uh, the smart firmer uh, from precision planning could be used and that data coming from that sensor for very right seeding decisions. So Elizabeth, uh, I'll turn it over for you, oh, turn it over to you. Thanks, John. I'd like to build some on the information that Chris just shared. We've learned a lot from the seeding rate trials over the years, but many farmers are ready to take the next steps to improve profitability. And variable rate seeding may be an option, especially when you're seeing yield variability from year to year. So over the last four years, we've conducted 32 corn seeding rate trials, and we've observed the optimum corn seeding rate for most fields in Ohio falls between 33 and 35,000 seeds per acre. Of course, each year we see areas of the state where yield varies, mostly due to weather. We've got wet years and dry years, and different areas of the state experience them in different years. But more importantly, within fields, we often see areas that fare better or worse when we see these conditions. And one way to improve profitability is to manage that variability through something like variable rate seeding. So matching the seeding rate with the productivity levels in the field. Most typically for corn, you're gonna to wanna to push the seeding rate in areas of the field that can support the higher density and still produce, and then pull back on areas that are less productive to save costs. There are many ways that you can go about generating a seeding rate prescription and finding the best method for your farm and your field is gonna take some work and to make sure that it's gonna pay off. For this trial, we wanted to better understand the potential for using data from the precision planting smart firmers to generate seeding rate prescriptions. Smart firmers are an optical sensor that mount onto planter row units and they provide estimates on the go for several different soil characteristics. But for this project, we honed in on the organic matter estimates. And the reason we chose the organic matter estimates is because over the past few years, we've been using this data to select zones for soil sampling to look at nitrogen rates. And the results we were seeing were impressive. On this slide, you can see that aggregated soil samples were showing visible differences in both soil color and texture, which led us to wonder if this data could lead to a successful seed rate prescription. So for the field trial, we selected three seeding rates 26, 30, and 36,000 seeds per acre. And then we selected three breakpoints in organic matter content where the seeding rates would change. We matched the highest seeding rate with the areas of the field with the highest organic matter content and the lowest seeding rate with the areas with the lowest organic matter content. We then laid strips of each seeding rate across the whole field to allow us to compare the performance of each seeding rate across all of the organic matter zones so that we could see if we made the best decision at the end of the season. The maps you see on the right show the organic matter layer generated by the smart firmers, and then the as-planted map showing the four replications across the field. When we compared yield results at the end of the season, we saw that the variable rate treatment averaged the highest yield and shared the top spot with the 30,000 seeds per acre treatment. 
the yield for the variable rate treatment was higher than both the highest and the lowest seeding rate treatments, and the difference ended up being statistically significant. So we went and also compared the yield responses for each seeding rate by organic matter content. And we saw that the yield response was different by organic matter zone. However, once we were over two and a half percent, the responses were very similar. And although the yields continued to increase at the higher organic matter contents, it may make sense to group those zones for future years since we see that the yield curve plateaued after 30,000 seeds per acre for both of them. So we do think that the weather at this location likely impacted the yield results in 2020. The crop experienced a very dry stretch during late June and most of July that hampered yields, especially after the uncharacteristically wet spring we had. This likely led to the differences we saw in yield response at the higher organic matter, so higher organic matter soils. Um, we believe that they might have held moisture more effectively longer into the season. And so one of the reasons we believe that is that we also conducted this type of analysis at an irrigated location in Miami County. Um, they were also fairly dry for part of the season, but we didn't see the same yield differences between organic matter zones. Um, we think that this was likely because when irrigation was an option, we were able to take that uncertainty out of the picture. Um, this is a good demonstration about how a method that works really well at one location might not work the way you would expect at a different location. So it's important to um, look at your individual field and maybe through on-farm research, really hone in on the things that you think might work for that field and test them out. So to summarize, the Smart Farmer data worked really well to identify two distinct yield zones in a non-irrigated field. And when we used those zones, for a variable rate prescription, it increased returns in that field. We do believe the differences in water holding capacity was due to the increased organic matter content, and that was a driving factor in the success of this approach for 2020. Um, we're excited to continue this work in 2021 to see if we see similar results. So if you are interested in participating in a trial like this, please get in touch with me. My email is on this slide. And finally, I would like to thank my partner farms on this trial, uh, Michael Beam at Beam Precision Ag and Brett Kenworthy at Kenworthy Farms, uh, two fantastic guys to work with. And I'm really excited that we're getting to learn together on how to make variable rate seeding work in a profitable way. So thank you. Really, really good insights, Elizabeth. And uh, I you know I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing uh, what can be done in 2021 to, to add into your data set and, and learn more about this. We know sensors are, are becoming more prevalent and uh, using some of this data to, to drive decisions in particular variable rate seeding becomes very important. So we wanna thank everyone today, Aaron, Amanda, Will, Chris, and Dr. Hawkins for sharing. Uh, I encourage you to follow up with them as well. Um, but uh, before we get to our uh, uh, Q&A, I uh, just wanna say uh, again, thanks for their uh, time here and sharing some of the results from 2020 and, and look forward to hearing what they learn here in the coming 2021 season.